Welcome to Worldview. Church-state separation has a long history in the United States. Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association on January 1st, 1802, encouraging them that the President of the United States agreed with them that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legislative powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. Jefferson went on to assure the association concerned that no man ought to suffer in name, person, or effects on account of his religious opinions, that they should rejoice with him in that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. The genius of the First Amendment, ensuring freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, a free press, and freedom to redress grievances with the government has been the platform for the prosperity of the United States. The First Amendment is the difference between a country, a free country, and one that isn't, though they may claim to be. A recent example of this is found in the country of China. In its annual report on international freedom released in August, the U.S. State Department denounced China's continued suppression of religious liberty. China's official policy states theirs is a country where citizens have freedom of religious belief. However, according to the United States Department of State, the report states, in practice, the government exercised state control over religion and restricted the activities and personal freedom of religious adherents when these were perceived to threaten state or Chinese Communist Party interests. According to Breitbart.com, in a new set of education rules, the Chinese Communist Party is urging citizens to spy on their neighbors and report parents who raise their children in a religious faith or have them attend religious services. ChinaAid.org reports that the majority Muslim northwestern region of Xinjiang, new education rules encourage people to inform on parents who send their kids to religious schools or coerce them to practice religion. The new rules went into effect on November 1st. They declare that parents may not organize, lure, or force minors into attending religious activities or force them to wear religious dress or symbols. Moreover, they cannot abet, coerce, attract, or tolerate minors' participation in terrorism, extremism, and underground scripture studies. Without being more specific, this language gives Beijing broad latitude to determine what is or is not extremist behavior. Citizens, spies, seeing their neighbors encouraging belief in their children, have the right to stop these kinds of behaviors and report them to the public security authorities. According to Breitbart.com, Chinese law prohibits children under the age of 18 from receiving any religious education, and the government-approved Christian Church, the Three Self Patriotic Movement, explicitly bans its members from bringing their children up in the Christian faith, labeling the practice brainwashing. Education is very big in China. The ruling Communist Party earlier in 2016 issued a warning to parents that if their children did not stop attending church, they will be barred from attending college. This notice was sent to all the schools in Huaqi, explained Mao. The public security intend to cleanse us and ask us to join the Three Self Church. The house church that members have also reportedly been pressured into signing a document vowing that they will not take minors into the church. Additionally, parents have been told that they will be sued if they bring their children to church, while the children themselves will not be allowed to take the college entrance exam or be admitted into the army. The Three South Church is a church under government control. It's the church that the government is encouraging other Protestant independent groups to join. Mal added, Yesterday morning I questioned a government official in our township saying, We do not accept the way you handled our church public meetings. What regulations does the central government have prohibiting the church meetings? Let us see them, he said. The higher level leadership ordered us to do this. We are just doing as they say. Other countries are facing similar issues, though not quite as radical as China's. The trend towards suppression of Christian beliefs is becoming more widespread. Freedom of religion and freedom of speech is being subordinated by LGBT rights. Belfast, Ireland used to be the battleground for the violent strife in Northern Ireland during the 20th century. Over the last year, a fight has been playing out in the case of Asher's Baking Company. 
Gareth Lee walked into the Belfast Bakery founded in 1992. He asked for a cake with Bert and Ernie from Sesame Street to be put on the cake. The cake was ordered, paid for, but at some point Mr. Lee wanted the slogan support gay marriage printed on the cake. General Manager Daniel MacArthur refused. Being a Christian, he did not want to support a message or a cause that violated his conscience. He was happy to serve Lee, but could not put the message on the cake. The local Equality Commission for Northern Ireland penalized Asher's Bakery. The initial settlement was for 500 pounds, or about $600 US. Daniel and Amy MacArthur appealed the case. The Court of Appeal of Belfast upheld the original decision, finding that Asher's Bakery had discriminated against the local gay rights activist. In the end, a judge decided the man in the middle here had been treated differently because of his sexuality. Shy of publicity, Gareth Lee left it to the Equality Commission, which funded the legal action, to speak for him. It actually says to people who take part in commercial enterprises that they must act within the anti-discrimination framework. The judge did say she respected the strongly held faith of those who work for Asher's, but she said when she was applying the fair balance here that it was clear, looking at the case law, that the current anti-discrimination law provides that fair balance. The court found that Asher Bakery had refused to provide the cake because Gareth Lee was a homosexual. Daniel MacArthur made his case that he had not discriminated against Lee, that he had been willing to serve him, willing to make the cake for him, with Bert and Ernie, just not willing to put the slogan, support gay marriage, on the cake. But in the end, the judge sided with Lee. MacArthur was disappointed in the ruling and gave his side of the story. If equality law means people can be punished for politely refusing to support other people's causes, then equality law needs to change. This ruling undermines democratic freedom, it undermines religious freedom, and it undermines free speech. We had served Mr. Lee before and would be happy to serve him again. The judges accepted that we did not know Mr. Lee was gay and that he was not the reason we declined the order. We have always said it. It was never about the customer, it was about the message, and the court accepted that today. But now we're being told that we have to promote the message even if it's against our conscience. What we refused to do was to be involved with promoting a political campaign to change marriage law in Northern Ireland. Because we're Christians, we support the current law and we felt that making this cake would make us responsible for its message. We wouldn't decorate a cake with a pornographic picture or with swear words. We wouldn't even decorate a cake with a spiteful message about gay people because to do so would be to endorse and promote it. According to Breitbart.com, attorney for MacArthur, John Larkin, attorney general for Northern Ireland said, if the county court ruling against Asher's was right, the law used against the bakery fall foul of Northern Ireland's constitutional law. Larkin pointed out that Gareth Lee was able to ask another bakery to fulfill the order and that the court did not have to force Asher's to do it. He said, Although the case for the plaintiff is put pleasantly and with every appearance of sweet reasonableness, what cannot be disguised is that the defendants are being compelled on pain of civil liability to burn a pinch of incense at the altar of a god they do not worship. Politicians weighed in as well. Gregory Campbell, East Londonderry MP, expressed disappointment at the outcome. Campbell said, Freedom of expression and freedom of conscience are vital to any democracy and most people support attempts to defend these fundamental rights. Unfortunately, today, those rights have been undermined. People do not need to share the MacArthur family's Christian faith to support the stance they have taken on this issue. No one needs to share their Christian faith to realize the ruling is a defeat for freedom of expression. As a result of this ruling, will other commercial firms be forced to supply produce with political or religious slogans attached with which they profoundly disagree? One of his colleagues expressed his views this way. What we cannot have is a hierarchy of rights. And today there is a clear hierarchy being established that gay rights are more important than the rights of people to hold religious beliefs. What rights are more important than others? The American Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 60s fought to give African Americans the right to be served at the same place as a white person, to use the same restrooms and to drink from the same water fountain. This has not been the case here. Gareth Lee was served, and rightly so.
but his cause, his ideology, was not embraced by the MacArthur's. Lawyers for Mr. Lee disagreed that there was a hierarchy of rights. That if there was a bakery run by a gay man that refused to ice a cake saying support uh, uh, opposite sex marriage, it would be just as much unlawful as it was in this case. And that really does prove the point that there aren't a, a hierarchy of rights. Most of the bakery, flower, and wedding establishments have been Christian. We have yet to see a lawsuit brought against a Muslim baker that won't bake a pro-homosexual cake, or a Jewish florist that refuses to provide flowers or balloons with a pro-homosexual message. And it's likely that should a Christian be turned away from a homosexual bakery because they wanted a pro-heterosexual cake, they would just go down the street to a bakery that would provide the product without bringing some sort of lawsuit. So despite what the lawyers for Mr. Lee say, lawsuits brought by Christians against gay bakers will likely never arise. There does seem to be a trend abroad that gay rights supersede religious rights, which does not bode well for religious liberty. The court made a suggestion to the MacArthur's that would prevent them from having to risk a court appearance again. All business owners will have to be willing to promote any cause or campaign no matter how much they disagree with it, or as the Equality Commission have suggested, they should perhaps just close down. Just shut down your business, and you won't have to worry about these lawsuits in the future. Religious discrimination is on the rise. Dr. Eric Walsh was the Director of Public Health in Los Angeles, California. He also served on President Obama's Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. He credits his mom and the beliefs of his church to keeping him out of trouble as he was growing up. He's held on to those beliefs. In 2014, he was offered a position with the Georgia Department of Health. I went to the third and final interview. A few days later, I was offered a position in Georgia to be the district health director for a northwest section of, of, of Georgia. Walsh accepted the offer to serve as director for health for northwest Georgia. He tied up loose ends in California and began preparing to move his family cross-country to the state of Georgia. During those final preparations to move, Walsh received a strange request from the state. The state wanted copies of his sermons. As a Seventh-day Adventist, Dr. Walsh was active in his church and on occasion would speak there as well as national gatherings like Generation Youth for Christ. As Walsh continued to prepare for the move, he sent off four sermons to the Georgia Department of Health. I submitted four sermons to someone in the department, high up in the department. They reviewed those sermons, and the next day I uh, no longer had a job. Politely sent them copies of the sermons themselves. They reviewed them, and the very next day they fired. Dr. Walsh was stunned. Four sermons and a few YouTube videos later, the offer of the district health director for Northwest Georgia had been yanked. Walsh found out about it from a voicemail left on his phone. The caller forgot to hang up, and the answering machine recorded the subsequent conversation and laughter about the termination. According to Todd Starnes of Fox News, Walsh's attorney said the government was curious about sermons Dr. Walsh delivered on health, marriage, sexuality, world religion, science, and creationism. He also preached on what the Bible says regarding homosexuality. He has since filed a federal lawsuit charging state officials with engaging in religious discrimination. The attorney for Walsh, Jeremy Dyes, told Starnes he was fired for something he said in a sermon. If the government is allowed to fire someone over what he said in his sermons, they can come after any of us for our beliefs on anything. You know, kind of blown away at the idea that in the United States, you know, you could be a lay pastor and on the weekend, you know, deliver messages to congregations and that, that could be used against you. Um, when you apply for a job or when you're offered a job. That's not religious liberty in this country. At the very minimum, I expect that religious liberty means that we can find sanctuary in our own sanctuary. As a result of the lawsuit filed by Walsh against the Georgia Department of Public Health for religious discrimination, the department has now ordered Walsh to turn over his sermons to the government. Attorney General Samuel Olins contacted the attorneys for Walsh and told Walsh through them to please produce a copy of your sermon notes and or transcripts. Walsh's attorneys are astonished. Jeremy Dice concluded, It's an incredible intrusion on the sanctity of the pulpit. This is probably the most invasive reach into the pulpit by the state that I've ever seen. 
this is allowed to stand, it sets an incredibly terrible precedent for a country that's supposed to be based on certain inherent freedoms and rights. And if this is erased for Eric Walsh, it's erased for generations to come. Erased for generations to come. These stories regarding religious discrimination, especially Christian discrimination, are just the tip of the iceberg. There are many such cases, some of which are resulting in lawsuits. But the trend is alarming. If being allowed to attend college will be based on one's religious beliefs, if the owners of a small business are forced to express in their products a view that goes against their strongly held religious beliefs violating their conscience, and if a job offer is predicated upon which religious beliefs you hold rather than your qualifications, religious liberty is in trouble. The First Amendment states that laws in this country are not to prohibit the free exercise of one's religious faith. That principle is under fire here in America and around the world. There is still some hope in the court system, but who knows how long that will last. When you have the opportunity, educate your friends and neighbors on the importance of religious liberty. These freedoms we enjoy today are only as good as the country that's willing to stand up for them. Amid the struggles for religious liberty for Christians in different parts of the world, religious battle lines are being more sharply drawn between Europe and the Middle East. Austrian Archbishop Christoph Schönborn presided at Mass at St. Stephen's Cathedral on September 11, 2016. It commemorates the Feast of the Most Holy Name of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is the following day. The feast day has been a Catholic feast day since 1684, when Pope Innocent XI included it to commemorate the victory against the Ottoman Turks at the Battle of Vienna in 1683. The feast day has been removed from the Catholic calendar by Vatican II, but was then restored by Pope John Paul II in 2002. Cardinal Schönborn said, We ourselves are the very ones who have placed the Christian heritage of Europe in danger. Is this a third Islamic attempt to conquer Europe? Many Muslims say that Europe is at the end. Continuing, he stated, The prospect of a European Christian renewal is up to us. We must return to Christ, spread his gospel, and to deal with our fellow human beings, even strangers, with him in our hearts, with love and responsibility. He also spoke to the Catholic newspaper Der Sonntag, stating, Europe's Christian heritage is in danger because we Europeans have squandered it. It has nothing to do with Islam or even refugees. It is clear that Islamists would like to exploit our weakness, but they are not responsible for our weakness. We Europeans are responsible for that. Cardinal Schönborn sees Europe as weak right now because it has squandered its Catholic heritage. His solution is to strengthen Catholic influence in Europe. Is there Islamic threat to conquer Europe and Europeans? It depends on who you talk to, but certainly from the perspective of ISIS, there is. According to Robert Spencer, a foremost authority on ISIS, Rome is a prime target in order to bring about Armageddon. ISIS thinks that Rome is one of its primary goals and that it is in its timetable. It has a timetable wherein in the next 10 years, by the year 2025, it hopes to bring about Armageddon, the final struggle between good and evil, or between the Muslims and the non-Muslims, and that uh, one of the chief stepping stones to that Armageddon battle is the conquest of Rome, which they think they're going to have, they're going to be able to do within the next five years, that is by 2020. The threat against Rome has been targeted not so much at the city of Rome, but the city within the city, the Vatican. Islam and the Holy See have a long and sordid history. The Crusades, which took place over hundreds of years, shed much blood on both sides. The Crusades were initiated by the Holy Roman Empire when Pope Urban II in 1095 encouraged citizens to rise up against the Ottomans and regain the city of Jerusalem. By the 1400s, the Ottomans were knocking at the Holy Roman Empire's door. They conquered Constantinople in 1453, gaining control of the Eastern Roman Empire. They pushed their way up into Austria, but were defeated in the Battle of Vienna in 1683, the battle that Cardinal Schönborn was referring to. The Italian authorities are taking no chances. Guns and poses outside the Vatican. Extra police have been brought in to guard a holy city, now in the crosshairs of ISIS's unholy war. 
A recently released online ISIS video entitled Paris Before Rome features an unidentified speaker mentioning the conquest of Rome as the forces of the so-called caliphate spread from Iraq westward. St. Peter's Square, with a bit of photoshopping, was featured on the cover of Dabiq, ISIS's online magazine. ISIS, or the Islamic State, is trying to bring about the fulfillment of Quranic prophecy. They believe that the Quran teaches they should prepare for the return of the Muslim Messiah known as the Mahdi. They believe that Muhammad prophesied that the two great Roman cities would be conquered. Constantinople would be the first. As we've already stated, Constantinople fell in 1453. One of the cities has already been conquered. The other is waiting to be. Robert Spencer says that the plans for ISIS call for Rome to fall by 2020. But Rome is not the only place on the short list of ISIS conquests. Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Iran are also targets for conquest. Once Rome is conquered in this view, within the next five years, and then Israel will follow shortly after. They also believe that it, during this time period, they're going to conquer Saudi Arabia and Iran. They're not talking about doing it by conventional armies. They're talking about doing it by overwhelming these lands with sympathizers from within and an influx of other people from outside. But there is always another opinion, and some do not see ISIS as the large threat it claims to be. Emanuele Arolenghi of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington, D.C., does not see ISIS as a European threat, but rather the lone wolf similar to other terrorist attacks in Europe over the last several years. The concern should be commensurate to the reality of the threat. The Islamic State does not pose that kind of a threat today. I think that the much larger threat that we are concerned with in Europe is with the lone wolf terrorist who plots uh, a terror outrage against a school, against a supermarket, against a shopping mall, against an airport. It remains to be seen how viable ISIS is in attacking Rome or the Vatican. Bullies tend to have a lot of bluster to make themselves look bigger. Whether they can carry out an attack large enough to wound or capture the Vatican is still questionable. But that does not mean at some point they're not going to try. In December of last year, four men with ISIS ties were arrested for making threats against the Pope. According to Fox News, the suspects had posted on their Facebook pages images of themselves with weapons and in circumstances characteristic of Islamic State fighters. All four often visited a jihadist Facebook group whose members are known to be in Syria, where a few hundred Kosovo-born volunteers have joined the Islamic State group. Chief Prosecutor Tommaso Bonanno said that the most alarming messages were aimed at the Pope, stating, Remember, there won't be any Pope after this one. This is the last. Don't forget what I am telling you. Robert Spencer tells us that if ISIS is successful, blood will run in Vatican Square. They think that the conquest of Rome will be the complete sign of Islam's superiority over Christianity and defeat of Christianity. And they think that once this battle takes place at Dabiq, this final battle, which they see coming in by 10 years from now, in 2025, that the Muslims will battle the non-Muslims in this town in northern Syria, and then Jesus, the Muslim prophet, and the Mahdi will return to the earth, and they will together conquer and Islamize the world. And there was a Polish convert to Islam recently who uh, has joined the Islamic State, and he said, once we take Rome, we're going to carry out mass beheadings in St. Peter's Square. And so uh, this is the plan to, to convert uh, St. Peter's Square into a huge site of executions of people considered to be the enemies of Allah, chief among them the Pope in order to uh, cow and frighten the rest of the world into submitting to their rule. Clearly, ISIS is gunning for the Pope. The significance of toppling the Vatican would be a huge propaganda boost for ISIS. The struggles during the centuries of the Crusades have not passed away. The desire for Jerusalem is still very much alive in the hearts of both Rome and ISIS, and the effort to grasp it are intensifying. In the book of Revelation, there are two powers spoken of. The first is Papal Rome. The second is the armies that will enforce her calls for military action, the United States. 
And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. With Isis committing horrible atrocities and saying Papal Rome is a target, they are coalescing Catholics, Protestants, and Jews around the Pope. He is gaining the sympathies of the world, and any attack upon him or the Vatican would significantly expand those sympathies. This would further strengthen his role as the spiritual leader of the world and his ability to influence the greatest military power in the world. Now is the time to make sure you are right with God, that your sins are forgiven, as we see the signs of Jesus soon coming fulfilling. And that's it for this edition of Worldview.